Good to see each everyone here this morning. Welcome back those that we've been praying for and who have been recovering. We're so happy to see you among us and for our visitors. We're glad you've chosen to be with us. This is the third Sunday of the month. And for those that uh, know the order of our service, we are excited because this evening is our song and scripture service. But for those who might have been here the last couple months of last year, you also know that this means throughout 2019, at least to September, in the morning, it means we're talking about godly women. And so in our Godly Women series, this is part three, it's titled Ruth, Virtuous Devotion. And our text, you notice it just says Ruth. <laughs> no, no verses. We're not going to cover, be able to cover the entire book. I want you to remember as we go through this, this is not the purpose of studying the book of Ruth. She just happens to be one of the two women on this list who have a book named after her. The other one is Esther. The purpose is not a full study, comprehensive list of all the nuances and the things we can find in the book, but we're talking about Ruth herself and looking at her character. So you might feel there might be some things that we're going to miss in the book of Ruth, and that's okay. If, you, if it piques your interest, that might be something we could study about later to cover the full book, but for right now, we're going to be looking at Ruth herself and covering her character. For those of you that might be interested or curious to know where she fell on the list, uh, you might remember we had a list that we asked for the women to vote in the order you would like to hear the women that were on the list. Uh, the number one was Esther, but chronologically, uh, that won out the vote, so we were doing it chronologically. So Esther will be done in July. She's number seven chronologically. Number two was Sarah. We heard her last week. She actually falls number two chronologically as well. Eve was your number three pick. She got to be first chronologically. She was in January. Ruth was your number four pick. Chronologically, she falls number three. So those that voted for Ruth, you get to hear her a month early. Congratulations. <laughs> One of the reasons we want to look at something like this is there are examples we can look in the scriptures that provide example both good and bad, and that both men and women alike provide us with sources of strength and inspiration. Both men and women alike provide the examples of what not to do and the examples of what to do. As we talked about Eve, we find from Genesis 3.20, Adam named her Eve because she was the mother of all living. And she stands as an example of, yes, she fell to sin, but she also stands as an example of moving past sin. And that she ought to be remembered for more than just the fall in Genesis 3. She ought to be remembered for her actions of faith regarding two of her sons in Genesis chapter 4. And then last month we talked about Sarah. She gets the distinction of being the mother of three different categories from the scriptures. In Genesis 17, 16, she's called the mother of nations. In Galatians 4, 26 and 31, she's called the mother of saints. And in 1 Peter 3, 6, she's called the mother of godly wives. But as we look at Sarah and her character, she reminded us that she's an example of faith and overcoming one's weaknesses. And that to be a character of faith does not mean to be flawless or without sin. It means what we react to after we sin. Sarah was a great example of one who overcame her weaknesses. She is not remembered for those weaknesses when, we talk, when she's talked about in the New Testament. They talk about her being a woman of virtue, a woman of faith, and a godly example of what a godly wife ought to look like. And so as we talk about these godly women, we see that godly role models are greatly needed in our society today, and so it's good and right for us to go and look at how they impacted the societies and the families around them, and how that as we emulate that same character today, the type of influence for good that we can be. The book of Ruth records the life of a very virtuous woman whose name has become synonymous with faith, love, and devotion. But as we talk about Ruth, we need to remember who she is. She's an unlikely hero of the Old Testament because she was not an Israelite. She was a Moabite. She was from the Moabite nation. As we talked about a week or two ago, when we talked about remember Lot's wife, and we talked about the ungodly influence that Sodom and Gomorrah had and the devastating consequences its corruption had upon Lot and his family. When we talked about his daughters being so corrupted, that even after having escaped, they fell into an incestuous relationship with their father, all in the sake of preserving the family name. Moab and Ammon came from that union. Ammon and Moab were born to Lot, and thus they became somewhat cousins 
to the Israelites. That's who we're dealing with here. The descendants of Moab, Ruth and her and Orpah, both became daughters-in-law to this family we're going to talk about. And they were Moabitesses. But Ruth won the respect of God's people and even an honored place in the genealogy of Jesus. So let's talk about just a brief background. Just a brief background before we jump into where we're going to be beginning in Ruth chapter 1, starting in around 15. The background is this is in the backdrop of the days of the judges. You might remember our lesson on Samuel, about Elkanah and Hannah when they gave birth to Samuel, and what Samuel did in the restoration of Israel that fell under his rule as a judge. Before Samuel, we read that the days of Judges were a terrible time. They were a perilous time. We find twice in the Judges they are described as every man did what was right in their own eyes. And so it's this roller coaster of the people are disobedient, and then they cry out to God because they're oppressed by their enemies. God gives, sends a judge and delivers them. When that judge dies... The people rinse and repeat. They do the same thing over and over and over again. Ruth 1 verse 1 tells us that it is in the backdrop of the days of the judges that this story takes place. A famine forced a man from Bethlehem named Elimelech, and he and he took his family, his sons and his wife, and they moved to Moab for ten years. His sons, Malon and Chilion, they took daughters of Moab to be wives, Orpah and Ruth. But during this 10-year period, Elimelech dies, and shortly after that, his two sons die also, leaving Naomi a widow as well as her two daughters-in-law. And so it is upon this action that Naomi decides, she hears that the famine has relaxed or has come to a close in Israel, and she decides to go back to her family home of, in Israel. That is where we're going to be picking up with this story. But we're going to see that Ruth is an example of faith, virtue, love, and devotion. So as we turn into the opening pages of Ruth, we find in verses 1 to 7, they find themselves desolate in a foreign country. Their husbands have died. Naomi, Naomi determines to return to Bethlehem. Her two daughters-in-law desire to go with her. They said, we're going to go with you too. You're our family. But she encouraged them to stay in Moab. Apparently they were still fairly young. She said they're young. They had prospects for a, finding another husband and a new life there in Moab and that they would be better off than with her in Israel. And in verses 8 to 15, Naomi recognized that their, happy, their prospect for happiness was much better off in their own homeland than with her back in Israel. In Moab, they would be among their own people. In Israel, Ruth was a foreign woman unlikely to ever remarry. Because sometimes the Israelites looked upon these other nations as heathens, pagans. They were not to have anything to do with them. So we find that Orpah wept, kissed her mother-in-law, and in verse 15 says she returned to her people and to her gods. So Orpah left Naomi's side. But we're going to begin reading in verse 16 and get a, get a little glimpse of who Ruth was and the love and devotion that she had for her mother-in-law. But Ruth said, verse 16, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Ruth turned her back on her own people and their gods that cast her lot in with the people of God. She even abandoned whatever home she might have had waiting for her there. You know, this passage reminds me of Hebrews 11, 25 to 26. We're not going to turn there this morning, but I want to remind you of what it says or I encourage you to turn there on your own if you don't remember. It is said of Moses that he did the same thing. He chose the suffering of God's people rather than the lap of luxury he was in, the passing pleasures of sin, it says, desiring no longer to be called Pharaoh's son, but to choose instead to endure harsh treatment with the people of God. Moses made the same decision once. The difference with Moses was he was an Israelite, but even they treated him as a foreigner. Remember what they said? Who made you our judge? And he fled 
in the Midian. But Moses made the same choice to throw in his lot with God's people. And here Ruth is doing the same. She says, where you go, I go. Where your home is, is my home. Your God is now my God. Where you die, I die. She basically tells Naomi, your fate is mine. This was a complete act of faith. She had no idea what Israel was like, other than perhaps the stories the family told over the dinner table, what the customs that she would have observed in her husband and, and their family. She had not been to Israel as far as it is recorded for us to know. But even Boaz recognized this, and we're kind of jumping ahead in the story, but remember we're not doing a, a book study. We're not doing verse to verse. It would be easier in a study such as this just to read starting in verse 1 and go to the end, but we just don't have the time to do that this morning. So even Boaz recognized this in verse 11, that this was an act of faith recognized by the inhabitants of Bethlehem. He says to her in verse 12, May the Lord reward your work, and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. She's later going to remember those words and give a play on words when she reminds him that she wants him to protect her as as he is the, as if it was protection from the Lord. And we'll talk about that when we get into chapter 3. But I want to note the difference in these three widows. And here is where their names kind of come into play. Naomi was a grieving widow. Naomi means pleasant or my delight, depending on how the Hebrews looked at it. But because she was bereft of husband and sons, in Ruth chapter 1, 20 through 21, I want you to see what she says. She said to them as they, she came into Bethlehem, all the people gather, and they're like, is this Naomi? It's been 10 years. And they're saying, is this Naomi? Has she come back? She said, do not call me Naomi. Remember, Naomi means pleasant or my delight. She says, call me Mara. That means bitter or bitterness. For the Almighty, that is Shaddai, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full. Remember, she left Israel with her husband and two sons. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has witnessed against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi was a grieving widow. Bereft of husband and sons, she became bitter, even so far as telling them to call her Mara, which means bitter. Orpah was a leaving widow. Orpah means gazelle or mane. The, the root word that Orpah comes from means the hair on the back or the nape of the neck. And so it means mane, or as a proper name, means gazelle. And as a gazelle, she took flight. <laughs> she left Naomi and Ruth behind, Ruth 1, 14 to 15. But Ruth means friend or friendship. And think about the friend that Ruth was to Naomi. David once said that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, that could be sticks closer than a relative, right? This is what... Ruth was to Naomi. She was a cleaving widow. She would not part from Naomi, she says, except by death. Where you die, I die, in Ruth 1, 16-17. And that Ruth broke the last tie that bound her to her own country and people. She abandoned her kindred, the Moabites, renounced her gods, and by a great act of faith, joined herself to a new religion, a new people, and an absolutely new way of life. Because the Moabites did not observe the law of Moses. She's coming into a country that's going to observe the law of Moses when the people are obedient to God during the days of the judges. And we're going to see that in this time period, with this ugly backdrop of the days of the judges, she shines forth, along with some of the other characters, as being standing, shining lights of what God intended his people to become. Where Ruth was going was an uncertain life, one of poverty, one of hard work. But she had faith in Naomi and faith in Naomi's God. She said, your God is my God, renouncing whatever gods the Moabites may have worshipped. And we do find that Moab and Ammon both worshipped gods that demanded human sacrifice, Chemosh and Molech. Sometimes they were interchangeable. They worshipped one another's gods. So closely tied were the sons of Ammon and Moab. So she is forsaking all of that behind her to embrace Jehovah. Ruth had faith to leave all that she knew to put herself under the wings of Jehovah, as Boaz recognized in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 12. The second characteristic we want to notice besides faith is her virtue. 
Ruth was virtuous. Ruth chapter 2, 7 and verse 11. In verse 7 it says, And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. She's been sitting in the house for a little while. This is as Boaz comes into his field and he inquires about her. Who is this woman gleaning in the field? And so his servant in charge of the gleaners, he gives this report that she came to him and said, please let me glean. So verse 11, as Boaz is now talking with her directly, he says, all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me and how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. So it does tell us she perhaps had never been in Israel before. These were not her people. But she came anyway and is adapting herself to their customs as we're going to see. And so the people had come to love and respect her already in the short time she's been with them because they knew about her devotion to Naomi. They knew about her virtuous conduct. When she labored in the field, the workers noticed how hard she worked. In verse 7, the leader of the sheaves or the gatherers told Boaz, she came and has remained from the morning until now. She was a devoted and hard worker. In Ruth 3.11, now this is an interesting account, one of these strange customs that they had, and I was looking into it. So when it's reported to Naomi who Boaz is, she tells Ruth that Boaz is a close kinsman and that she needs to impress upon him his obligation to for the lever, leveret marriage. Leveret marriage means husband's brother. If you were to go back under the law, again, this was not Ruth's native law. This is the law she's learning. Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10, it says if a brother dies, then that person's brother or close kinsman is to take that brother's wife as his wife, to redeem her, as it is called, to be that kinsman redeemer, and to raise up descendants for the deceased brother. And so this is what Naomi tells Ruth, and she tells her how to do it. And so she finds where Boaz is sleeping in the early parts of chapter 3. She finds where he's sleeping. She goes and curls up at his feet. And we find that Boaz in the night is startled awake to find a woman at his feet. And she says, cover me with the edge of your garment. But I want you to look at that in verse 9. It says, and it happened in the middle of the night, verse 8, that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. He said, who are you? She answered, I'm Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. So the play on words here that is kind of lost, if you're not reading the New King James, maybe even the King James, I didn't look there, but in the New King James, it says, cover your wing over me. Remember Boaz said, you fled to the refuge of Jehovah's wings? That's the plural word of the same word she now uses for the covering. She says, cover me with your wing. The play on words there is reminding him of that protection from God. She says, cover me with your protection as if from the Lord. You're my close relative. She's telling him, you are our close relative. You need to perform the leveret marriage. Well, I was looking at this courting custom. This is a very strange courting custom by our standards. But in this day and time, this was the accepted practice for a woman to, to borrow a word or a phrase we use today, to be forward. If the man did not propose, this was the accepted way for a woman to tell a man she wanted him to marry her, was to curl up at his feet and ask him to cover her with some portion of his blanket or whatever he had with him. This served a couple functions. The woman, being forward, was willfully putting herself in subjection to the man by lying at his feet. And if he accepted her subjection and, sub and accepted her forwardness, he would cover her with the blanket, meaning, I will protect you. I also found that it's interesting that this custom is still practiced today in, middle, in many parts of the Middle East. So this is still an accepted practice even today for a woman to propose to a man. Ladies, how <laughs> would you have liked to have done that? But he says to her in verse 11, 
In verse 10, he says, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Perhaps indicating his age, he says this last kindness is even better than the first. What is the first? Her cleaving and devotion to Naomi. He says, what you have done for me is even better than that, and that you did not go after the young men, whether rich or poor. You chose me, letting us kind of know he might have been a more aged. But what I want us to read is verse 11. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask, for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Long before Solomon wrote about the woman of excellence from Proverbs 31 and verse 10, when he says an excellent or virtuous wife, who can find? Her value is far above rubies or gold and silver. Boaz found that in Ruth. He says, my people have reported to me, everybody knows you are a woman of excellence. So the New King James says virtue. He then does not leave her empty handed. He sends her away with six measures or ephahs of barley. I also did some reading and found that that means it's one tenth of a donkey's load. So he loaded her up with grain and he says he wanted her to take it back to Naomi so she wouldn't come back to her empty handed. This idea of Naomi leaving full and coming back empty, this is the beginning again of that play on words or themes. This is the beginning of Naomi becoming full once more. Starting with this, when she brings back the grain to Naomi, Naomi says he will settle this by the end of the day. <laughs> he will take care of this tomorrow, or by the, the day will not pass before he does all that he says he would do. When he learned it was Ruth, he told her he would do all that he could in the morning to redeem her under the law in verses 10 through 13. This word, virtuous woman, is from the Hebrew word, Kael, that means excellence, excellent, great, might, mighty, nobly, strong, valiant, valor, virtue, virtuous. Oftentimes, this is the word that is used when we talk about David's mighty men, that they were men of valor or valiant men. They were virtuous. This is the word used of Ruth. Not only did she work hard, but she maintained her purity, winning the respect due a virtuous woman. And for that, Boaz wanted her. For that, he would seek to redeem her despite a closer relative. Now, she says, you're a close relative, so he is to perform the leveret marriage. But he informs her that there is a closer relative, that he has to give up his right to Elimelech's lands, to taking care of Naomi and marrying Ruth. He has to give all that up before Boaz can do that. And so he says he will take care of that in the morning. And that's when Naomi says he won't rest until that matter is settled by the end of the day. So even Naomi must have known Boaz had some feelings for Ruth. And we're going to talk a little bit about that now, about what Boaz did for her, because she was virtuous. She was above reproach, and even God's people who would be foreigners to her came to love her too and spoke very highly of this Moabite woman. She trusted in God's care. In Ruth chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, again reminding us she is not of God's people. She is the foreigner among foreigners to her. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I might find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. It kind of lets us know because Naomi is not out in the field gleaning. that They were poor and destitute when they came back. That Naomi might have been aged in years. And so Ruth is doing the work for both of them. She is providing for Naomi. She trusted in the Lord's provision. She was content to accept the provisions God had made for widows, such as Naomi and herself. In Bethlehem, she took on the obligation of providing for both of them. And just as the law of Moses demanded, Leviticus 19.9, Leviticus 23.22, and Deuteronomy 24.19 tell us that the law gave provision for the poor to go into the field and pick up the scraps. And that the workers who were gathering the sheaves, if they dropped any, they were not allowed under the law of Moses, even though it meant money, they were not allowed to pick it up because it was to be left behind for the gleaners, for those who were poor and destitute and the widows. This was God's way of providing for them. 
I want you to see that Ruth adapted herself to the law of Moses and to the custom of the day in order to do it God's way. She trusted in God's care. She worked hard without complaint to provide for herself and her mother-in-law. And in the providence of God, she came to glean in the field of Boaz, who was that near kinsman to Elimelech. And in Ruth 3, 6, and 7, she trusted in the Lord's provision for a leveret, or husband's brother, marriage. This might have seemed odd to her coming from Moab, but as Naomi instructed her what to do, she did it. And she did it by faith, trusting in God. And she appealed to Boaz to perform the duties of a near kinsman, to raise up seed the one who died childless, according to Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10. And they're bringing up these other passages to show that she became a proselyte. Even though the, she came from Moab, she is adapting herself to the law of Moses and is doing it properly. Her husband Malon, we find in chapter 4, verse 10, is the one that Boaz would be bringing up children for. She walked within the law of Moses in both of these respects, and we're going to find God blessed her for it. And we see Boaz. And before we talk about the character of Boaz, I found a funny meme about Boaz, and it asks a question. What kind of man was Boaz before marriage? <laughs> Ruthless. Think about it. But we see Boaz as a type of Christ in the aspect of, of a redeemer. And in, in the aspect of Christ being a redeemer, we kind of see Boaz acting in that. And in that physical sense, he was a kinsman redeemer, as the law would have called him. But he was a man of great wealth, chapter 2, verse 1. He was compassionate to the stranger and this foreigner who had no claim on his favors. In fact, Ruth asks him in Ruth 2, 8 to 9, Who am I or why are you showing me such kindness? He would told her to stay in his fields with his maids. He said, so no harm would come upon you. He told her not to go to any other fields. He said, stay in my fields. Stay with my maids. And then he tells her, when you're thirsty, drink out of my own servant's water. He knew all about Ruth, even before she met him in Ruth 2.11. Kind of the, going back to the idea of the Lord. Jesus knows all about us, even before we come to know him. He knows about us. He knows our needs, our wants. He knows what we have done. And he wants to bless us as well. Here Boaz served Ruth graciously. Gracious. Grace, meaning unmerited favor. She had done nothing to deserve the kindness that he was showing to her. But all her needs were satisfied. In Ruth chapter 2 and verse 14, we find at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he served her roasted grain, and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. He treated her a little differently than the regular poor that were picking up the scraps. She had gained his attention and interest. And he had already, even before, she kind of told him she wanted him to marry her. Even before that, he had taken her under his wings of protection. He said to stay in my fields. And we're going to see that he granted her protection and prosperity for the future. In verses 15 to 16, he told the servants not to insult her, not to rebuke her, and he told them to purposely leave extra gain, grain for her to glean. So he said, drop a little extra on purpose. Don't insult her. Don't mock her. Don't rebuke her. In fact, I want you to give her more to pick up than what you would normally do. He didn't care about the money. He was looking out for her. In doing this, he secured her safety and success, starting in Ruth 2, 21 to 23. When she's reporting to Naomi, it says, Then Ruth the Moabite said, Furthermore, he said to me, You should stay close to my servants until they finished all my harvest. He invited her to stay in his field until the barley harvest was over. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids, so that others do not fall upon you in another field. So they recognize there's a danger of people taking advantage of the poor or the widows as they're gleaning in these fields. Boaz offered her protection by telling her to stay with his normally hired hands, stay with the maids, drink from their water, and even invited her to eat 
with the reapers. And he said he would redeem. Remember, that means to buy back all that belonged to Elimelech and his sons. And he would marry Ruth to raise up a descendant to Malon. As we get into chapter 4, another interesting custom comes to our mind. Boaz goes up to the gate. It says, he sat down there, and behold, the close relative to whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the closest relative, Naomi, who's come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to her brother Elimelech. That was Naomi's husband. So I thought to inform you, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased. And then he's reminding him of the law of Moses. You're going to be the leveret marriage to Ruth. He says, the widow of the deceased that is Malon, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. What he's saying is, whatever inheritance you have, because you have to marry Ruth, all transfers over to Malon. That was what the law of Moses stated. So the close relative said in verse 6, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Either it's the land that he's inherited, or it's the land that he possesses that's going to be passed down to his children. You see, if he marries Ruth, whatever children they have, under the law, that inheritance will switch from his children for Malon. And so he says, I don't want to do that. He says, redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land. To confirm any matter, a man removed his sandal and gave it to another, and this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself, and he removed his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. He redeemed all that belonged to Elimelech and his sons. Now, according to the law, this should have gone a little differently. If you were to look in Deuteronomy 29, verse 9, we find it is the widow that is called upon to remove the sandal of the kinsman that refuses, and she's to spit in his face and say, thus done to all close relatives who refuse the leveret marriage. Maybe this man removed his own sandal and gave it to Boaz because he would forego the humiliation of the spitting in his face. <laughs> but he removed his own sandal and just handed it to Boaz, saying, all right, you've got my sandal, the land is yours. I also found this was a custom that symbolized the right of the new owner to walk the land that he just bought. Because he holds the shoe or the sandal of the one that sold it to him. It's a strange custom to us today, but the symbolism works. It makes sense of why they did that. But as we look at all these things, from tragedy came faith, and from faith came great blessings. And we can read of Ruth that she had great love and devotion. In Ruth 4.15 it says, May he also be to you, or those are the women saying to Naomi, after the birth of her and Boaz's first child, it says, may he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. The people of the land recognized how much Ruth loved her mother-in-law. Now there are a lot of jokes about mother-in-laws in our day and time. But not between Ruth and Naomi. Not in the way that we hear today of the vehemence, mocking, the making fun of. We see none of that with Ruth and Naomi. In fact, the people saw a, a woman who came into their midst, adapted herself to their customs and law, their God, all to, she might take care of her mother-in-law. It has been said, many men have had affliction, none like Job, 
Many women have had tribulation, none like Naomi. She was one of the Lord's people who, like Job, had been called to suffer. And she said, I went out full, I came back empty. I am not pleasant, I'm not Naomi, I am bitter. Here the women are saying to her, May this baby be the restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. He's better to you. Or she, not Ruth is better to you than seven sons and has given birth to this one child. May he be that sustainer. The beginning of Naomi becoming full again because of the providence and their trust and care in God. Ruth became to Naomi better than seven sons. Ruth recognized Naomi's plight, was moved with love and compassion to go with her and stand by her in her hours of need. She said, my fate is your fate. Where you go, I go. Your land is my land. Your home is my home. Your God, my God, where you die, I die. They loved and cared for each other. In Ruth chapter 3 and verse 1, we know that Naomi loved Ruth too. It says, then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? She saw in Boaz their chance for Ruth to be happy again, to have that husband that she didn't think she could ever find among God's people. She may have had it easier in Moab among her own people, but out of love she went with Naomi. And what we see from that is that God blessed her among Israel because she walked in the pathway of duty. Orpah turned her back on duty to find a pleasurable life on earth. It's implied that she went back to stay among Moab because it might have been easier for her in verses 14 and 15. But Ruth turned her back on that, that easy way of life in Moab to do what duty demanded. Verses 16 to 17 of chapter 1. Again, reminding us of Moses turning his back to the temporary passing pleasures of sin to throw in his lot with God's people. Ruth sacrificed everything that might fascinate, fascinate a young woman that she might fulfill those demands of devotion to her mother-in-law. She gave up association with her family, her kinsmen, even her friends to move to Israel. She committed herself to caring for her aged mother-in-law, who, according to the idea that she did not go into the fields with her, could not provide for herself. While others were enjoying life's temporal pleasures, Ruth was one of devotion and duty to her mother-in-law. And we see from Ruth 4, 11 through 22, God blessed her for it. Boaz was a close relative and very generous. He was a descendant of Perez. That might ring a bell. He was the son of Judah and Tamar. If you go back to Genesis 38, you see that was a leveret marriage scenario gone all manner of wrong. <laughs> but Boaz and Ruth had a son, Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. And from King David's line, Jesus is born. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah from Perez and a descendant of David, according to Matthew 1 and Acts chapter 2. Ruth chapter 4, 11 and 12, the elders who witnessed the redemption said, May the woman you bring in your home be like Leah and Rachel, for they built the house of Israel. And may your house be like the house of Perez. In verse 12, when they say, Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. Little did they know how true their proverb of blessing would come. Through Jesus, all the nations are blessed, and his spiritual house, the church, is far greater than the house of Israel. His kingdom is one without borders. His kingdom is one that still grows by leaps and bounds today, as men and women turn their hearts to be devoted to God as Ruth once was, to adapt their lives to his laws, his priorities, his customs that we might be blessed and have that eternal rest in heaven. This woman of virtue, this woman of excellence, as Solomon later writes about saying that her value is far worth more than rubies and silver and gold, is an ancestor of the physical side of the Son of God. And look in Matthew 1 and verse 5 and see it specifically stated that Jesus came from the line of Boaz and Ruth. By her life of faith, her virtue, her love and devotion, God blessed Ruth and Naomi in ways that they couldn't even see. It reminds me in the book of Ephesians when it says that God is able to do far more abundantly, super abundantly in the Greek than we even ask or think. While they went, while Naomi felt they came back empty, 
God filled them up once more in ways that they couldn't even see and couldn't even fathom. Some people, when going through trials of life, wonder if it's worth it to just not give up. We can see in the account of Naomi and Ruth, who felt, Naomi's sake, she felt bitter. She felt that she had nothing left to give, nothing left to live for. Their account gives us hope that when one is virtuous, when one seeks after God's ways, God will bless and reward in his own time. Virtue is that strength of character to do what is right, no matter what. In our Bible class this morning, in the adult class, we talked about integrity. That the author wrote, integrity is what we do when no one else is watching. That's virtue. Virtue is that strength of character to do what is right, no matter what, even when no one is looking. Even when we think it's something we could easily get away with doing. We know that God is watching. And we guard our hearts. You know, as the years have passed, the lives of both Orpah and Ruth are long gone. Orpah's name has passed into oblivion, having nearly been forgotten. Some people, if you mention Orpah, they don't know. That might sound familiar, it might ring a distant bell, but they don't know what that is. They don't know who she is. But if you mention Ruth, all manner of images pop into your head from studying the book of Ruth. She passed down to her children an honorable name, a name still given to ladies today, one we have in attendance with us this morning. But our modern-day Ruths, those are those who are not named Ruth, but her character, that woman of excellence, that woman of virtue, our modern-day Ruths also passed down a legacy to their families, a legacy that teaches their children to be devoted to God and committed to those in their care. Just as Ruth worked doubly hard, she worked from morning to evening to provide for her and her mother-in-law. The modern-day Ruths will teach their children to be devoted to God and be devoted to their families. As we conclude this lesson on Ruth, I want us to be cognizant of all these characters, all these characteristics that Ruth possessed. And may her God-fearing, virtuous conduct be an example to all of us that we might always seek to do things in God's way. If you're here this morning, not a Christian, now is your chance to become a child of God in His kingdom, to repent of your sins, to be baptized, knowing that when you rise from the waters of baptism, your sins are washed away, you start as a new creature, walking down a new path of life. And if you are a Christian this this morning, perhaps not serving Him to the best of your ability, perhaps not serving Him in His way, let us learn the example of Ruth, And even though a foreigner, whether you're a new Christian or an old one, we adapt our lives to what his word tells us to live by. And you will be blessed for it. Your duty this morning, if you are not serving him the way that you ought, is to repent. And if we can assist you in any way, whether it's the waters of baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, come forward now while we stand and while we stand.